God does not stand towards the sinner as the executioner of the sentence against transgression. But he leaves the rejectors of his mercy to themselves to reap what which, uh, that which they have sown. And we explained it in the previous program in regards to who killed King Saul. So, was it King Saul? As he says in First Chronicles chapter 10, verses 3 and 4. Or was God, as he says in First Chronicles chapter 10, verses 13 and 14. Who killed him? Both. <laughs> he killed himself because God destroyed him. Or God killed him. How does God destroy it? By removing himself. By accepting the fact that he's limited to his character. And his character is love. And embedded in his love is the freedom of choice. And when Saul looked at God and said, Listen, I want nothing to do with you. God says, are you sure? I want nothing to do with you. You told me that you love me. Yes, then you need to let me do what I want to do. Now, we know other things in regards to the scriptures. Jesus said, you have seen me. You have seen the Father. I want you to notice something. If we get 11,000 scriptures in regards to the state of the dead, and we've got four or five scriptures that appears to sort of have a little bit of a uh, contradiction or, or not saying the same thing that clearly. The biggest bulk overrules the smallest bulk. We agree with that, right? When Emmanuel, God with us, says to us, you've seen me, you've seen how my father is, you only need one scripture. You only need that scripture, and that overrules absolutely everything other that appears to contradict to that statement. Why? Because God has spoken. You don't need a thousand times Jesus repeating that. You only needed that in the scriptures. You've seen me, you've seen the Father. Now, all that man needs to know, this is from Testaments for the Church, Volume 8, all the man needs to know, or can know of God, has been revealed in the life and character of his son. Question. When Jesus came into the picture in the first gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when he came into the picture, the people back then and the context that he walked into was a believe God believing people, yes or not? Yes. Were they a Torah-believing people? Were they a Scripture-believing people? Okay. So why does the Bible tell us that when Jesus came, the land that was in great darkness saw a great light? Think about it. They had the entire Old Testament. And how were they? In darkness. Whoa, that's scary. How can you have three quarters of this book and be in darkness? Okay, now I've been using my laptop here at the campgrounds to do my morning devotions. I normally don't use my laptop, but I had to use my laptop now because we are in a little room with my girls and my boy. And it's pitch dark, dark. And I don't want to wake them up. And I forgot my torch. It doesn't matter if I have the scriptures. If I don't have light to read it, I can't read it. What is the light that illuminates the scriptures? Christ. You cannot read the Old Testament without Christ. Here, here they are. They have all the Old Testament. They got no Christ. In fact, after Christ came, they're still in darkness because they rejected Christ. So what do you do? You get the Bible. You find Christ. 
and then you get that torch of Christ, and then you go to anywhere in the Bible. And anywhere in the Bible that is in darkness cannot overrule what the light says. It's in fact the light that needs to overrule the darkness. Does that make sense? Okay. In order to rightly understood and appreciate it, every truth in the Word of God from Genesis to Revelation might be studied in the light which streams from the cross of Calvary and in connection with the wondrous central truth of the Savior's atonement. The character of God is represented, manifested, is broadcast light out from the incarnation to the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is our basis of our interpretation. We can't just go and interpret the Bible in fragments or fragmented. Because I'm going to tell you one thing. God is not bipolar. Did you get that? 